Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, talking about three mistakes that are costing you a fortune. My name is Ryan Miller. I'm the founder and CEO of Aetna Interactive. Uh, I see a couple of you are just joining us now, so we're going to take care of a tiny bit of logistical business before we get things rolling. Uh, for those that are brand new to the GoToWebinar control panel, on the right-hand side of your screen, you have a control panel that will allow you to interact with me during today's session. If it's not already expanded, uh, just to the left of the word questions, you can click on that arrow to open up the screen so that I know that you can hear me. I want to have a, uh, invite you to uh, type in a question or simply a hello message, and that way we know that uh, both you're familiar with the control panel and every, uh, every other aspect of our connection today is functional. Uh, at the same time, I want to reassure everyone that we will be recording today's webinar. Oh, thank you guys for the messages. That's great. And so for those that were unable to make it to the live session today but um, had registered, we'll share back approximately two to three business days after today's session a link where you can view this session in replay. Oh, thank you, everybody. That's a great message. I'm glad that you can hear me. So let's go ahead, and we're going to dive right in. We have about 45 to 50 minutes of content. We'll reserve time at the end here for uh, additional questions that may come in. Uh, let me take a moment again to introduce myself. My name is Ryan Miller. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Etna Interactive. And uh, I've enjoyed for the last 15 years working with elective medical practices in 11 different specialties, helping them to promote their practices online. Um, very, very lucky today to be in a company of 60 amazing people here in our offices in California. But we serve practices all over North America. Now, for those of you that are on the call today, um, I would say if we were to look kind of a, the split across the group, about half of you are physician owners of practices. Half of you are practice leaders, either CEOs, CMOs, COOs, or marketing managers for successful practices all over the US. And what we're going to talk about together are some of the challenges that we see with practices as they relate to strategy, sales integration, and the refinement of marketing through the use of data. Now, this is based on our years of experience looking at really three specific mistakes. The first of those are engaging in marketing without properly aligning strategy. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, earlier this year, uh, my, my business development manager, Al Ferguson, had stepped out of the office for a couple of days and it became my responsibility to field our new sales, in, sales inquiries. Uh, and on one particular day, we received two calls. And what was really interesting um, for me was that they both led with exactly the same question. They, the, the doctors called in and said, uh, yeah, we're shopping for social media. How much does it cost? Now, let me take you through. Now, these aren't the actual doctors. I use some stock photography as representation. But they, they look pretty darn close to who these two doctors were. The first of them was a doctor who was um, winding down his practice. He'd, he'd been operating uh, less and less over the, the previous five years. He was a general plastic surgeon. Um, unfortunately, he had a, a very messy divorce and uh, had realized that he was going to need to re-engage, not re-engage um, at his current level, re-engage at a level close to his peak for five more years to be able to afford to retire in the manner that he had expected. Now, over the, the last five years, uh, what he shared was that uh, he had reduced his staff because staff knew that he would be retiring and uh, people who had career ambitions had moved on. He hadn't engaged in any marketing. In fact, he was coasting into an all-time low in terms of his productivity, um, but he needed immediate results. He needed to see that cash flow pick back up right away. Now, um, we'll contrast that with the other doctor that we um, were interacting with in that same period of time. Now, in her particular case, the scenario was, was quite different. Right? We saw a picture where, um, I apologize, the, uh, there's a little bit of a lag, it looks like, in the delivery of that slide content. But that was a young female plastic surgeon who um, was just at the prime, was just at the start of her career. And in, in her particular instance, um, she had, in those first five years of operating in her practice, she had fallen well behind the benchmark of what both the industry predicted and what she wanted to see producing uh, she wanted to be producing for herself and her own practice. She um, had engaged in social media marketing herself uh, and had seen some reasonable amount of success. She found some decent followers. And in fact, in posting, she was a, a facial plastic surgeon, in posting her rhinoplasty photography online, she 
was developing some small amount of um, of demand for for those uh, those services, but it simply wasn't enough growth for her ambitions. What we learned as well is that she had tried two different SEO vendors. Um, both seemed to have produced no results, and in fact, when we took a deeper dive, what we learned is the first of those two vendors had actually gotten her blacklisted with Google. So, and you'll pardon me for one sec. We're going to jump out there and see if we can. Uh, get back in line in terms of slide delivery. So for the first of the two doctor's strategies, what we realized is the site that he had, which it was in uh, uh, very much in disrepair, had not been maintained, that that site would need to be maintained, that it would need to be updated to better reflect who he was in his brand to help us help him sell his services and the value of his consultation. We also knew that given his need for immediate return, a channel like pay-per-click advertising was going to be way more important than social media. And the fact that he didn't have any staff or really deep community involvement said that his initial question, which was how much the social media cost was moot because social media was probably going to be the, the wrong thing for him um, at large. It simply wasn't going to fulfill his need. Now, um, jumping back and looking at the female plastic surgeon and what her strategy needed to look like, very different as well. So we knew that for her, she was going to need a full website redesign. Um, we were going to plan on focusing initially on local search engine optimization as a vehicle to drive immediate demand in her, traffic, in her practice, while at the same time supporting her with additional training to support and amplify her own natural abilities. She had a great start with her own social media, but she was going to need some help. What we realized was that and it, it, it's what I hope you're taking away from the story, that different ambitions, different circumstances, ultimately different, dictate fundamentally different marketing strategies. And that when you lead the effort by saying, oh, I think I need SEO and SEO or, or social media, whatever it might be, is a, uh, a one-size-fits-all kind of strategy, you're doing yourself and the agency that you work with a disservice. Because the strategy of the practice, what your unique needs are, what your goals are, it's really going to define both the direction and the intensity of your online marketing. Now, the time for you as a practice leader or a marketing leader within your practice to step back and ask questions it really is right now. And those questions are going to be aligned here. The first is going to be in these four areas about your unique set of targets. So revenue growth. I think we know instinctively that a practice that hopes to grow $200,000 next year is going to need to do something different than the practice that hopes to grow $2 million next year. And where you have capacity for growth matters. Now, if some of your doctors or some of your providers are 100% occupied, marketing doesn't make a lot of sense. But if we have providers that are 75, 50 or less utilized, we ultimately need to focus our marketing efforts to drive demand where they are most likely to convert services. And the procedure mix that's most important to you will also dictate the type of marketing that's implemented. Facelift patients can be very, very challenging uh, to find. If we're looking at a, a, a cataract patient on the ophthalmology side, we're looking at an audience that's generally skewing older. But if we're looking at non-surgical services, social media is a great option, or younger patients like LASIK patients or uh, a patient that's a candidate in the example I gave, like rhinoplasty, we can actually find some of those patients on platforms like Instagram. So your procedure mix if it's not being openly discussed, it needs to be because it's going to dictate where and how you market. Now, the markets as well matter. If you are located in a major metropolitan market, uh, let's just use Dallas as an example, and you have a Dallas address, and you know that you can meet all of your growth goals by attracting more patients who are in Dallas, that's great. But if you're in a secondary market, right outside of a major metro, or even a rural market, your geographic strategy may be focused on stealing patients, uh, stealing market share, if you will, from adjacent markets so that you can hit those goals. That needs to be understood as well because some marketing channels are very effective at reaching into neighboring territories while others are not. The other thing for you to take stock of are these four things, the assets available to you that can help your marketing. Now, brand equity is an important one. How well known are you in your, mar in your market? Your marketing assets can be um, beneficial to discuss openly. And 
Assets are going to be anything that you own or control that you can leverage for your marketing. These might be the size and the number of subscribers to your email newsletter, the following that you have on social media, the library of video or blog posts that you've put together, the position that you hold, either with national or local media outlets. All of those things can be applied and should be openly discussed with the agencies that are serving you in the name of online marketing. Now, staff availability is also important because a good vendor partner is going to work with the members of your team to maximize the return from every dollar that you spend online. Do you have a member of your team that can be an active contributor in social media? Is there someone on your staff that you've designated as the reputation lead who's keeping an eye on and leading the practice response to your online reviews? And of course, the reputation itself is an asset, or in some cases, unfortunately, it's a liability. Where does your reputation stand today? And unfortunately, if it's weak or poor, you need to go back and prioritize repairing reputation before you throw too much more money at active lead generation and cultivating interest in the practice. Now, I'll put this offer out there for those that are going to try to do it on their own and would like some help. Feel free to email me after the webinar to request a copy of a worksheet that we can share with you to help you organize your thoughts, both about your targets and your assets, so that you can have a more productive conversation with your agency. This is inspired by the strategic process that we use with our clients, but again, um, for taking the time out of your day, we're happy to share that with you. Now, this is the moment in time where a lot of folks who are uncomfortable with online marketing step back and say, hey, it's great, I, I now have taken stock of those things that I can bring to the table that can influence my marketing choices, but what do I have to do with those? Now, I know that everybody hates writing business plans. It's difficult sometimes to forecast in the future. But what I want to reassure you is that you don't need to put together too much detail to provide a clear direction for your internal teams and your agency partners. And it might look like these next two slides. A clear explanation of your revenue goals. Um, this is based on a real world example. This is a facial plastic surgery practice. In this particular case, they were under their revenue targets and they've set a pretty ambitious growth goal relative to their previously small size. They were running under a million dollars. They knew their benchmark was about 1.4 to 1.5, and they wanted to beat their benchmark in one year. So it means a pretty steep curve in terms of their revenue growth for calendar year 2018. Now, a part of how that was gonna happen, we knew would come through growth and improved organic search engine ranking and referrals coming from Google. 20% was something that in the discussion between the client and our own internal teams we knew could be achieved based on the 11,000 people that found them in Google last year. Now, specifically, we knew that online leads were going to have to outpace the growth that was going to come from Google. Now, this is an expression of our ambition to improve lead capture from the site through changes in optimization on the actual pages itself. And given how quickly they needed to see this revenue growth ramp up, we knew that a big portion of that would need to come from something that was a little bit easier for us to control in the short term, which is pay-per-click advertising. In this particular case, we're able to model about 350,000 in revenue with an eight to one return on investment. Practice hadn't previously been engaged in PPC, so this was going to be a new addition to their mix. And we see in a few clear statements, what's gonna happen with the strategy? Well, SEO is going to be there, but it's gonna be narrowly targeted on those procedures that are most important to their revenue growth and aligned with their available provider. We're gonna expand the profitability of pay-per-click as was mentioned in the objective set before and refine the site design with an ongoing set of A-B tests throughout the year to improve lead capture from the visitors who were already coming through the site because the data showed us that they were underperforming in that area. We wanna support those long-term organic rankings. So we're stepping now into the following, the subsequent calendar year into 2019 uh, playing the long game as a part of our value system by investing in some really high quality blog posts. And then at the end of the day, we knew that some of their revenue would have to come from non-surgicals. Non-surgical revenue growth in the aesthetic field is supported well by email marketing. Your statements can be that simple when you're outlining how you're going to get to the goal. But the challenge for you as a leader in marketing is that it's your responsibility to look for credible indications from your own team or your agency that there is A, clear alignment with the objectives of your marketing, and B, a well-articulated strategy of how you're gonna make those objectives happen. Now, it, it wouldn't be a presentation uh, about strategy if we didn't bring Sun Tzu into the mix, but what we see today in most practices is that you're leading with tactics, right? You're shopping for SEO or you're shopping for social media, and what you need to be shopping for first and foremost is strategy. 
these tactics without strategy, well, the, as Sun Tzu said it, it's the noise before defeat. So your first opportunity, the first mistake we want you to avoid, and the chance to increase practic practice revenues is to make sure that you've clearly articulated your goals, at the very least, goals in the context of the amount of revenue you hope to produce, and then work with your partners, whether they're internal or within an agency, to create those measurable objectives that you see are going to help you achieve that specific goal. Now, the second major mistake that we see among practice leaders is a failure to build the systems internally to nurture those patient prospects. Because the reality that we see when we look at online marketing is a lot of people call your practice who aren't yet ready for a procedure. Um, indulge me for a second, I wanna share another story. A longtime client of ours was using our call tracking service. And shortly after it was activated, we were doing the initial call tracking analysis, listening to calls. And what we heard was a call that sounded like this. A woman called in and said, this is a plastic surgery practice. A woman called in and said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling today because I was referred by a friend to the doctor. Uh, I'm very interested in a tummy tuck, but I'm terrified of general anesthesia. Can you do a tummy tuck without general anesthesia? And at that point uh, on, in the call recording, we could hear her lower the phone. She didn't actually hang up the phone or put it on hold and turn to ask to a colleague, does the doctor do that? Do they, do they do a procedure, a tummy tuck without general anesthesia? And we can hear in the background the voice of the colleague saying, gosh, I don't think so. At which point the receptionist picks the phone back up and says, gosh, I'm really sorry. We don't do that. And then hangs up the phone. Now, we had a patient in the call who was, very interested in meeting with the doctor, had been referred to the doctor by a friend, um, and we had someone at the front desk who was well-meaning, but missed a bunch of important opportunities. They um, didn't record the caller's name, the procedure interest, or how to get back. They didn't offer them at least the opportunity to meet with the doctor, giving the doctor the opportunity to decide how best to proceed. And what we learned a, a few days later was um, they also missed an important truth, which was their doctor actually did do that procedure. So uh, after listening to the call, we contacted the doctor and the doctor had a dilemma. What do, what, what do I do? I don't want the patient to think I'm stalking them. But uh, the course of action we decided on was that we would call the patient back, explain that we use call recording as a part of routine training, that we happened to notice that the patient was given misinformation, and we wanted to invite them in for a consultation. Now, that turned into more than $16,000 worth of procedure revenue because the patient ultimately ended up having combined surgery, had two procedures inside the practice. So the lesson here is even when the patient is bound and determined to get in, you may not have the training or the systems in place to empower you to properly follow up and get them in. But the reality is the, the some significant number, and I'll show you what that number looks like here in just a second, of patients are somewhere earlier in their decision-making process than begging you for a consultation or an appointment with your doctors. In almost all cases, even when we're talking about clinical issues, uh, let's use cataracts as an example, patients are gonna go through a stage of early awareness. They're gonna be researching during a decision-making phase, uh, common to see people reaching out to practices with questions during this, this part of the phase. They're gonna be gathering information. Often this is when patients are consulting things like their friends, their referring doctors, and your online reputation and your website to influence their final decision. And then and only then are they actually gonna be ready to come in for that appointment. And what happens today is if you're investing in marketing, you're gonna be touching patients at all four points of this process. And interestingly, when we look at how long that takes, um, Care Credit did a study now, I think this is back in 2016 that they released this data, looking at patients in, well, the specialties represented by everyone on this call today, plastic surgery, facial plastic surgery, dermatology, ophthalmology, all are in this study. And what they found is that patients were spending between 76 and 145 uh, days researching online before they ultimately requested a consultation. Uh, and the website Real Self in their research found that those numbers are actually probably underrepresenting the truth, that the research cycle may be twice as long. And so the question is, if somebody comes to you on day 50 of their research, are you equipped to leave a positive experience in the mind of that prospect so that they'll come back to you when they get to say day 145. Because the number looks like this, 65% of all of the inquiries that you're gonna get are likely not ready immediately for consultation or treatment on that first inquiry. 
And what we find when we look at most practices is they simply don't have the systems in place to, er, to nurture those early stage inquiries. Taking as the example of that call that I shared with you right at the beginning of this section, they didn't bother to take down the name, the phone number, and the procedure interest because they didn't have any system in place or a mandate from practice leadership to be doing that activity. There's nothing to help them or no, no tool that would leverage them for follow-up. And so there was no reason to capture the information from the caller. But as we look ahead to the future of your practice, we have to recognize that your patients are expecting great service on all these different platforms across email, phone, text messaging, social media, and most practices are struggling just to deal with their phone today. Now, we know that the optimal response time for both calls and email inquiries is about five minutes. If you miss the call, you've got to get back. It's, it's a fundamental truth, and it's not because patients are unreasonable. It's just because they're busy, and they move on with the rest of their lives if you're not able to connect with them quickly. So the problem that we have is one that's bigger than just you know, not having adequate training in the front office. It's first and foremost about a lack of connection between your systems, because what we want is we want your word of mouth, we want your marketing to be driving information into some kind of CRM tool. And that that CRM tool, that's the place at CRM standing for customer relationship management, where we can record the names and contact information of the people who've connected with our marketing, but are not yet perhaps ready for the consultation or the treatment. Now, there are a lot of tools in this space, um, uh, solution reach, demand force. Uh, one of our favorite in, is called My Med Leads. And they capture that information. They provide your staff with the prompts, the tools, the reminders to stay in touch with those people until they're finally ready to become patients. At that point, one click transfers them into your EMR and your practice management software, empowering you to make the most of every marketing investment. Now, I mentioned My Med Leads. It provides, in this particular case, an example of the doctor's dashboard where you can actually manage the performance metrics around working the opportunities created for marketing. What are the conversion ratios? How many calls on average are being attempted per lead? How are you doing relative to other practice? How long is it taking your practice to respond to those inquiries when they come in? These are the kinds of metrics that you're going to be really need to have your eye on as a practice leader to understand how you're doing it, taking the opportunities created for marketing and leveraging that opportunity into tomorrow's patients. Because as we think about your staffing, that's the next gap that you have. In most offices today, there's some kind of investment happening in marketing, and we all know how important word of mouth is. In a traditional sales organization, that would pass opportunities, the names of prospective patients, into someone who is responsible for both warming the opportunity, answering their question, qualifying them, making sure that they were both uh, candidates, uh, physically candidates, financially for uh, treatment inside the practice. They then come back into the office for their consultation, and somebody's responsible for the, the final activity of closing treatment with the practice. Now, what's missing in most offices is the person you know, past the reception responsibility who is recording, nurturing, communicating, and ultimately handing prospective patients into the practice. This is a major gap in many offices. So if we think about the second opportunity, the big mistake that many practices are making is investing heavily in marketing activities and then forgetting that a lot of the leads that will be generated are going to need to be nurtured and supported in order for them to become patients down the road. So the advice for practice leaders here is twofold. First, make sure that you have technology in place that ensures that every inquiry that you get first and foremost gets recorded. Now this may be as simple as admonishing the staff to use a, a, a secure spreadsheet or other document where you're recording all of the day's calls. That you're taking their, their name, their contact information, their procedure interests, and a few qualifying questions about how soon they're hoping to see someone for their treatment, whether or not they've already had a consultation, and specifically, what is your next action with them? How will you be following up? At the same time, make sure that people know that this is a part of their responsibility and to find some clear protocols about how often you're going to follow up and how exactly you're going to nurture those leads. Now, let's talk about the third and final mistake. And it's really one about measurement, about 
neglecting to apply rigor to how you use and refine your marketing. Unfortunately, we've been taught, I think, over the years that, um, well, I think we probably remember the old saying that you just said it and forget it. That, that, that old Showtime rotisserie oven, Ron Popeil, for those that don't remember, was the, the host that, uh, that, that I think made those annoying infomercials. Uh, a lot of people think that the saying somehow applies to marketing, and that's, that's just not true, but it's certainly reflected in the data. So Infusionsoft, at the end of 2016, published some results. They would interviewed small business owners. Um, asking them specifically, you know, what's failing you as it relates to the efficacy of your online marketing? And is it working or is it not working? And what we found is that 62% of businesses said either I don't know or it's not working. And what is especially concerning for me is that nearly half, more than any other response, nearly half of all small business marketers really didn't know if it was working or why. They just couldn't track it at all. Now we come to understand that a little bit better when we look at the data last year from irrelevance. You know, a third of practices, and this is specifically looking at medical practices, said, "Well, I, I'm I'm dissatisfied with my marketing because I'm I'm not getting the results that I would expect." About one in four practices said, "I can't even measure the effectiveness of my marketing at all." About one in five said, "And it's probably because I just don't have the expertise. I don't feel conversant enough in what I'm doing." to be able to understand or measure what's working or not working. And so what I'm hoping to, to leave with you in the next little bit is really the, the first message is a, a little bit of a, me standing on the soapbox that as, as the leader in the practice is responsible for your marketing decisions, you have to at least become conversant. You have to gather enough, enough expertise to feel confident demanding measurement and performance of your marketing so that you can address the first concern, the lowest concern here, that you, you know that you have the experience, that you have the systems in place that you can measure, so that if you're not getting the results that you expect, that you can actually coach a change in direction. Now, I think we can actually blame someone like John Wanamaker for this. He's thought of uh, as sort of the father of modern advertising at the, the turn of the century, the, uh, back in the uh, early 1900s. Uh, he, he said this, he said, half the money I spent on advertising is wasted. We've all seen this quote before. The, the trouble is, I don't know which half. And the thing I need you to accept today is this is a 100-year-old quote, and it's simply not true anymore. We can know precisely what's working, but it's going to take a little discipline. Now, there are three things that have to happen for you to get here. The first is you have to capture reliable referral source data with all of your patient inquiries. Now we can do this both with online forms and interestingly enough, we can do it with phone calls as well. I'll explain that in just a second. Then when we've gathered information, we have to audit looking for what it was or how that lead converted inside of our practice. Did that inquiry turn into a consultation or a treatment? Was there revenue generated? Then we have to have the discipline on some regular basis to really look at that data and ask the question, what does it tell us about the efficacy of our individual investments. And can we use that data to refine our marketing? In some cases, it means eliminating whole channels of marketing and investing in new ones. In others, it just means small refinements to improve performance. And that cycle or those activities are cyclical, where I'm going to capture the data, audit the data, use the data to enhance my performance. I will then capture more data, audit again, and enhance once more. This sounds like a lot of work, it's really not. And in most cases, this should be the thing that your agency or your marketing team is doing for you. So let's take a second here and explain a little bit better how this works. In terms of capturing referral source data, um, this is something we've done for, for, well, for over 15 years now. It's not a new technology, but when we build sites, we put co code underneath them that allows us to capture where someone was right before they arrived at our site. And the reason why we do that is because self-report Asking the patient, how did you hear about us, is notoriously inaccurate. There are all kinds of studies that show that patients will routinely pick that they heard about you on marketing channels that you're not even engaged in. So if they're engaged or they see you in search engine optimization, if you're engaged in pay-per-click advertising, you're active on social media, and they click through, we're able to capture that without asking the patient. At the same time, if they've um, responded to one of your offline activities, where we've provided you with, or your agency's provided you with a custom URL, you can use that information as well to pair the name, email, and phone number that they've 
volunteer with your online forms with the origin of their referral. We then take that information and write it into a secure database at the same time that you get the email. Now, in the case that we're working with one of those tools, those CRM systems that we talked about earlier, like MyMedLeads, we're able to pass that information directly into their systems so that either in our system or in those third-party tools, you can take what you gain from the patient, their, their identity, their email, their phone number, the procedure interest, and then signify how far did they make it? Did they complete a consultation? Did they have, do they have their procedure? How much revenue resulted? And we can then filter that information back to understand our performance by channel. We can go through and we can look at what was the return? How much revenue came out of each one of these channels? What was the ROI relative to the investment in that individual channel? And where do we need to look to either shift budget or cancel online or offline advertising activities that aren't performing relative to others? Now, when we look at tools like I gave the example of my med leads, I'll use one of their screenshots there as well. They can actually draw the data back out of, in many cases, your practice management or EMR software so that we see that very specific return, total number of leads, the numbers of appointments made, completed, and the revenue attached to those channels and get that information in an automated way. We can get it through our systems, we can get it through third parties, but you need to get it as a practice leader to make important and inform decisions about where you should be spending your money online. So the quick recap here is just remember, it takes some discipline. We've got to capture that information, get it through our site, and get it secure so that we can audit that information and enhance our marketing over time. It's just the thing, you're entrusted as the leaders of your practice to both create value and mitigate risk. You're investing in marketing to create the value, but mitigating risk requires measurement and refinement of your strategies to ensure that you're getting the most for your office. And I, I love this quote from um, Charles Duhigg. He's the author of The Power of Habit, a really popular business book, that between calculated risk and reckless decision-making, well, that's the dividing line between profit and loss. And where we want you to be as a practice leader is operating from a place where you feel comfortable with the risks you're taking because you know that you're measuring. So the third opportunity here to avoid the most common mistakes that we see practice leaders making is ensuring that you're getting that detailed referral source data that you're periodically auditing the performance down to the level of individual marketing channels and that you're using that data well, with your internal team or with your agency to refine that marketing spend. So I'm gonna pause here for a second just as I get ready to sum up and remind you that on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a questions box. That questions box, if it's not already open, click the arrow to expand it. And if you have a question that you'd like to type in for us to take a, a little bit deeper dive, you can go ahead and type that in now. We'll answer that together here in just a second. So number one, we need to avoid the mistake of a misalignment between marketing and goals, or worse, marketing that's just you know, a shotgun approach and not, not properly serving what the goals of the practice are. Let the goals shape online, by, online marketing by bringing that information actively into the discussion with your, your internal teams responsible for marketing and the agencies or the vendors that you serve. The second thing is make sure that you have either a process or a piece of software that's going to empower you to record and actively nurture prospective patients, those leads that you're creating, and that you've taken the time to communicate with your staff about new expectations and responsibilities. This is probably gonna be modif mean modifying some job descriptions as well, so that they can find the time, the training is needed, and hopefully the tools to be successful in taking more of the inquiries that come from your marketing and turning them into new patients. And then as well, we want you to routinely measure and actively refine your marketing by taking the time to capture referral source data and audit that information at least a few times each year. Now, if we can help your practice, I'll bring this information up on the screen for those that are interested. I think we have a fantastic video newsletter in which we cover topics like this each month. You can subscribe online there. We'd welcome feedback on Facebook. It's a great place to review us if you found this presentation useful. If you have questions for me or for our agency, you can feel free to contact me directly. Okay, the first question that I see coming in is about how does one go about actually tracking that referral source data? Um, it's a little techni technical, but thank you for the question. The way that we do it is when we build our sites, we have code underneath that looks at the browser's history to identify where they were before they arrived. 
In the case that they searched Google, it will be a Google address that they were at just before they came in. Uh, the same is true of social media. And when we configure pay-per-click campaigns, we are actively inserting uh, five levels of detail about which of the ads, which piece of creative, which keywords that user was responding to. We then set that in a cookie, they carry it around with them, so that when we send uh, to our clients the details of those, those online inquiries, that they, um, they get the stuff that was volunteered by the patient, you know, their name, their contact information, the procedure, but then they also get the full URL string of where they were before they arrived. Uh, we can do that offline by configuring custom URLs that, that trigger those, those same variables. So for example, if you were engaged in outdoor advertising, like a, a billboard, we can give you a custom web address that when that address is used, it automatically sets a note that this lead is only attributable to your billboard so that when they fill out a form or they initiate a call, that that goes into the practice. Um, next question is about call recording. So how does call recording work? Um, your, your vendor, your agency can likely help you configure this. Uh, we provide it as a service for our clients where um, you can install on your website a number that replaces your own, uh, your own phone number. And when it's called, it will um, do two things. Uh, it will record the calls so that you can securely listen to it for analyzing your customer service, um, but also uh, will typically engage a function called a whisper so that when the uh, call connects with your office, your staff will hear, this is a lead from your website, so that they don't have to ask the patient where they're coming from and they can properly record that information inside of your CRM or your practice management software. Uh, hold on one second. We have a question about CRM systems. Um, and the, the, let's see if I can, sorry, I'm just trying to read it. There's a little bit of detail in there. Uh, it, so it's, it's asking about really two things. One, how do we prioritize features when selecting a CRM system? Um, and then two, it looks like it's a, a secondary question about training. So in terms of prioritizing features, uh, we certainly have some favorites out there, but the place I recommend that everybody start, if you don't already have a CRM system, is with the practice management software that you currently use. Talk to that company and ask them which CRM tools they are actively partnered with. Because one of the promises of CRM systems that you wanna take advantage of is the ability to, at the, the stroke of a mouse, push data from the CRM system into the practice management software to facilitate appointment scheduling and eliminate the need for double entry of data. So I think that's perhaps one of the most important features to start with. That will provide you with a short list of CRM tools. Some of the features that we can anticipate are going to be really important for your practice are going to be things like um, automated text-based appointment reminders, the ability to do communication ladders or sequential automated communication with both patients and prospects. So for example, if we have somebody who expresses interest in LASIK in your practice and doesn't easily con immediately convert, you're gonna want a piece of software that will automate both outbound communications, perhaps sending text or email messages on a, on a, a prepared schedule, and automatically prompt members of your staff with to-do lists when you want them following up with those, um, those patients manually. So um, that's gonna be important for you as well. In terms of the training, this is where we see most systems fall down. And it's true both for CRM software and for practice management. Um, be sure that you, when you're interviewing or selecting software, that you ask them about available training options and how they're gonna interface um, with members of your team for ongoing and training and support. And some of the best ones out there um, both offer you know, uh, in initial installation training as well as ongoing support for your team. So it looks like right now that's the last of our questions. I wanna thank everybody again for taking time out of their day uh, to talk a little bit more about three mistakes, three opportunities that you have to improve performance in your practice and to be a stronger leader in online marketing. So thank you again. And again, we'll be recording today's or we've recorded today's presentation. We'll be sending that out within three to five business days. Have a great day, bye-bye.